Anne, the Princess Royal. For many, the princess who symbolizes the best of the royal family. She often do four engagements a day in different parts of the country. Always gets to the heart of the project. She's a fantastically professional royal. She might not be about hugs and cuddles and compassion, but she is about duty and responsibility and hard work. Among the Queen's children, Anne's devotion to the monarchy and to her parents has been exemplary. It's Anne who's the most responsible and certainly the one that the Queen really lent on at the end of her life. The Queen could see that Anne also was devoted to duty. So I'm not totally useless. I was quite well educated one way or another. Tonight, royal insiders trace her decades-long journey from strong-willed youngster to the king's respected counsellor. Princess Anne was the son that Prince Philip never had. She is very much in his image. And offer insights into what Anne is really like. On this occasion, I'm marginally better organised than usual. I just left my voice behind. She doesn't tolerate fools. She can be snappy. She can reduce grown men to tears. How does it feel having a Buckingham Palace as your private property? Well, I don't know, because it isn't. We reveal the truth behind Anne's most memorable moments. From the dramatic... Good evening. There's been an assassination attempt on Princess Anne and Captain Mark Phillips. It was an extraordinary incident, and she handled it in the most extraordinary way. To the controversial. The ball? Very mirror. Never been mentioned. Throughout Anne's extraordinary life, her example of dignity and duty is a hard act to follow. Anne's motto, and I think she said this for riding, was if you fall, get up, carry on, and mind your manners. So I think it, it's almost a motto for life. The Princess Royal. <laughs> the 12th of October, 2021. In a service at Westminster Abbey, Queen Elizabeth marks the centenary of the Royal British Legion. Close by is her daughter Anne, the Princess Royal. The monarch uses a walking stick in public for the first time, but it's far from being her only means of support. I think it's fascinating with hindsight now to think about all the occasions that Anne delegated for the Queen. I'm talking about occasions like Sandhurst, the military school, the Epsom Derby during the Platinum Jubilee celebrations. The Queen wasn't able to go. Who went in her place? Princess Anne. It's worth remembering, although Anne is only 16th in line, she's one of only three members of the royal family who, who does investitures. So um, when there was a backlog because of COVID, she was actually doing two investitures a day, one morning, one afternoon. So that shows how important she was to the Queen as she is to the King. The Princess Royal also assists the Queen in getting to grips with new technology, as this popular video of their charming Zoom call reveals. Good morning, uh, at Windsor. Good morning. I'm very glad to have been able to join you. Can you see everybody? You should have six people on your screen. Yes, well, I can see four anyway. OK, very well. Actually, you don't need me. You know what I look like. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I think the closeness which had always been there for life between these two women, we now all had an insight into that. On the 8th of September 2022, as the Queen's life draws to an end, the devoted and dutiful Anne remains by her mother's side. Those of us looking at pictures could see the Queen was ailing, but I, I think the, the family had greater insights. It's no accident that Charles and Camilla were in Scotland and that Tim Lawrence and Anne were actually were at Balmain. Anne, who spent the last 24 hours of the Queen's life at her bedside with her, 
The fact that Anne talked publicly about what a privilege it had been to share the last moments of her mother's life with her. Unlike many families who mourn their beloved parents in private, the Princess Royal and her close relatives have no choice but to honor their mother's memory in the full glare of the watching world. Anne dutifully accompanies her mother on her last great journey. The fact that Anne was absolutely at the center of the mourning for the Queen was not accidental. I think it was deserved that Anne was publicly recognized as having done a lot for her mother. She became very symbolic of the royal family and the mourning of the Queen. And she did her duty in those few days. Princess Anne's brother Charles is now king, and her support for the monarchy remains as devoted as ever. In January 2023, alongside her youngest brother, Prince Edward, she is appointed a councillor of state to deputize for the monarch in times of need. The spouse of the monarch is automatically one of those five, and then it's the four next in line to the throne. We lost Philip and he wasn't replaced by anybody. And then we pretty much lost Harry and Andrew. You're not meant to be a council of state if you live abroad, and you're not meant to be a council of state if you're not a working member of the royal family, which neither of them were. While Prince Harry's memoir and Netflix TV series criticize the king and his family, who better to fill the void he left than Anne, a constant presence for Charles throughout their lives. She's a culture of state who can stand in for the monarch. Um, she's in some ways his closest confidant after his wife Camilla. She's an extremely significant, influential and important member of the royal family. Worth remembering that both the king and the princess royal were born in the reign of George VI. To truly understand Anne's supportive relationship with Charles and her long-held devotion to duty, it's important to consider her upbringing during a deeply traditional era of the monarchy. Born in August 1950, while King George VI was still the monarch, Princess Anne was the only daughter of the then Princess Elizabeth and Prince Philip, and sister to Charles, Andrew and Edward. Arriving at Ballater Station with her family, the Queen was received by the Marquis of Aberdeen. Anne had a very 19th century childhood, a very traditional royal childhood. When she was born, of course, the Queen was not yet Queen. She was still Princess Elizabeth. So Anne was not born at Buckingham Palace, as many people think, but actually at Clarence House, where the then Princess Elizabeth and Prince Philip moved after their wedding. Despite Charles being 18 months older and heir to the throne, it was Anne who was assertive from a young age. Anne's always been a tomboy. She's always been the one who goes out and climbs trees and is very courageous and very confident, very willing to explore the world and find her own way in the world. In a way, perhaps that Charles has been a little more timid, a shyer, more sensitive character. Anne is absolutely a chip off the old block. As a child, even though she was a couple of years younger than the Prince of Wales, she was quite happy to take him on in any kind of physical rough and tumble, and she often came out on top. The princess had to become independent from an early age. She was not yet three years old when her mother became queen in 1952. You have to remember that Anne was the daughter of a working mum, which in those days was not that usual. And she had a very hard working mum. Elizabeth was away a huge amount. I mean, Anne was tiny when her mum and dad went off for six months around the Commonwealth. So she and Charles were left not exactly to fend for themselves, but certainly they were largely brought up by nannies and governesses. Growing up, Princess Anne spent much of her time separated from her family. Anne had quite a solitary childhood in many ways because uh, she had her brother Charles and then there wasn't another sibling for a further 10 years actually. So it was herself and Charles at home being educated at home until Charles went off to boarding school and then there was just Anne and she was left with her governess for I think the best part of seven years but it must have been a very strange existence. Unlike her mother, 
Princess Anne was never destined to be queen. In a way, it's quite sad because you have this amazing kind of role model in her mother who was a very strong woman, a very powerful woman, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, which was kind of post-war, when women's rights and equality was really, really starting to take off and be incredibly important. And her mother was a great role model. And in some ways, it's a shame that Anne wasn't born first. But even if she had have been first, the rules back then, the law of primogenitor back then meant that any boy, any son born to a monarch would always take precedence over his sister. Because of the rule of primogenitor at the time, all of Anne's brothers overtook her in the order of succession. When she was born, she was third in line to the throne after her brother and her mother. Grandfather was then still the king. And then when Princess Elizabeth ascended to the throne, Anne obviously moved up and for many years, she was number two to Charles. But obviously things changed when the Queen had that second burst of motherhood with the arrival of Prince Andrew in 1960 and then four years later, Prince Edward in 64. Anne moved down below her brothers. That was the system then. A lot of people have never been very comfortable with it, but that's how it was. And I think Anne accepted it. Princess Anne discovered that there were advantages to not being the heir. She knew that she was never destined to be queen, and it meant that she was spared a lot of the upbringing that her brothers had to go through. She was allowed a little more freedom. She was able to do what she wanted to do, wear the kind of clothes she wanted to do, see who she wanted to see. It was a degree of freedom, encouraged, I have to say, in part by her parents. Throughout her life, the princess was pushed further away from the throne. She slipped from third to 16th in line to the throne. Now, of course, that's perfectly ordinary for members of the royal family, but it must be difficult for your own sense of identity, for your sense of confidence. Who am I? What's my role in the world? Am I respected? And she has managed to carve out a role for herself which doesn't rely on the pecking order of the line of succession, but on who she is, what she's achieved, how hard she works, and how much she's respected for that. Anne may have fallen down the line of succession, but many believe she was number one in her father's eyes. We know that Charles found it difficult, found it difficult being the eldest son, found it difficult being Prince Philip's son, but there wasn't quite the same pressure on Anne. As she grew older, Anne's similarities to her father brought them ever closer. I've always thought that Princess Anne was the son that Prince Philip never had. Anne is very straightforward, very blunt, calls a spade a spade, but is also very funny. Does the press really annoy you? Yes, I think one... Yes, I think it does. I think okay. be very, it wouldn't really be doing its job if it wasn't. Both of them can be quite grumpy, both of them can be quite difficult. Both of them shoot from the hip, both of them say what they think. Both of them are kind of keep calm, keep bothering on. And both of them have a really strong work ethic. Anne had a rosy future ahead as a working royal. But would her strong character lose her favour? And how did she upset America as a teenager? She looked at the time as though she didn't want to be there, they said. She refused to answer anyone's questions, snappily saying, I don't give interviews. She doesn't tolerate fools. She can be snappy. She can reduce grown men to tears. May God bless her and all who sail in her. Princess Anne's dutiful work ethic was evident from a young age. In 1968, at 18 years old, she became a working royal. Anne didn't see the point of any further education. She'd had quite enough by the time she was 18 and said that she thought the university was a very overrated pastime. I decided, after my limited school career, not to go to university. Um, contrary to some reports, not because I couldn't go to university. <laughs> well, I didn't actually want to go to university. 
She was just out of school and she was going on engagements with her mother and father. When the Queen and Philip went to Australia in 1970, Anne wasn't even 20, she was still only 19. She accompanied them and it was the birth of what has become a real royal staple, the royal walkabout. There had never been a walkabout before, but such was the interest in the young teenage Princess Anne, and she was a very gamine and attractive teenager. The crowds turned out in their thousands. Princess Anne has devoted a large part of her life to official engagements and has acquired a notable reputation. She always has been one of, if not the most hardworking member of the royal family. I mean, she will carry out four or five engagements in one day. She could be in Scotland in the morning, London in the evening, and she would be very well briefed on every engagement and extremely professional. She's admitted she's a workaholic. Anne is very no-nonsense and she takes that approach to her work. She regularly tops the best-selling um, list in terms of the highest number of engagements. I think on an average year, she does anything from 350 to at most 500 engagements, both domestically in the UK and abroad. It's a huge workload. I remember Kevin MacLeod, who was the Canadian Secretary to the Queen, said of Anne in 2014, her credo, her literally her belief is, keep me busy, I'm here to work, I'm here to do good things, I'm here to meet as many people as possible. Anne may work hard behind the scenes, but for many years, this has been eclipsed in the media because of her relationship with the press. This was apparent from her first visit to the United States in 1970, when the princess was 19. One of her first foreign trips was to America, where she and Charles went together. And she was not very well received there at all. She went to the White House to visit Nixon when he was president. And there was a lot of negative press because she seemed to be so sulky. She looked at the time as though she didn't want to be there, they said. She refused to answer anyone's questions, snappily saying, I don't give interviews. She was very ungracious. It was very much noted that Anne didn't seem to have the friendly, soft, smiling face. She was wound up being dubbed Princess Sourpuss. The Americans said, why did she bother to come? It's quite clear she doesn't want to be here. So that was the beginning, actually, of pretty much a lifetime of often negative headlines for the princess. This early trip set a pattern for Anne's relationship with the media. The press become interested in her because she's actually rather attractive, if, if it's still OK to say that. She's the first member of the royal family to wear a mini skirt. She's actually a real trendsetter. I think as Anne um, gets to maturity, the attitude of the press is beginning to change. Famously, Anne said to the photographers, I think, naff off, or there might have been other words that were used. Some of Anne's brushes with the ever-inquisitive press were unexpected. In 1969, while visiting troops in Germany, the world saw another side of the princess. We were kind of all knocked out when she was 19 and she went to Germany on a job. And um, we were getting pictures back of her. She is the holder of a heavy goods vehicle license. And we saw her driving a 52-ton chieftain tank. Astonishing. She also, on that same trip, she fired a submachine gun from the hip and got eight bullseyes. And I think there will be lots of men looking at her in, in abject terror. This, here she was, a young woman, and she was capable of doing all of this. While Anne avoided the media's game, she worked very hard to support the Queen. Those in the know even regard the princess as the royal family's secret weapon. And I think Anne has always realised her power, her soft diplomacy, the ability to help, the ability for the royal family to reach areas that you know, traditionally prime ministers can't. You know, the royal family is a constant, they are always there. And particularly in areas of the world that have royal families, for instance, like the Middle East, when you send a member of the royal family to them on a state visit, it's immensely important. It conveys you know, huge prestige. And people take that very seriously. And often members of the royal family, like Anne, are used to help trade deals, help 
diplomatic relations and I think Anne has been very successful at that and she's done that from a very young age. Well Anne had this brilliant knack of sort of being uh, the pathfinder if you like for the royals. If there was a slightly tricky destination go to it was always Anne they would send in first because she has a great ability at making people feel welcome and being enormously empathetic with people. I don't think Anne feels that she must be the centre of attention. Hello, ma'am. Good evening. Nice to see you. Like her mother and her father, she sees it as being about duty and service and about shining a light on, on the things she's there to see. In 1990, the Queen entrusted Princess Anne with visiting the Soviet Union on her behalf. This would be the first official visit there by a member of the royal family in more than 70 years. The last had come just before the Tsar, a distant relative of the Queen, was executed after the 1917 revolution. I suppose her most significant overseas trip was to Soviet Russia, as it then was, in 1990. How does it feel having a Buckingham Palace as your private property? <laughs> well, I don't know, because it isn't. <laughs> she made a huge impact. It was a great success. Big crowds came out to see her. People were interested in her. And the feedback was incredibly successful and very positive for Britain. That was a massive deal in terms of the thawing of the relations between the UK and Russia. So that was a really, really important tour that Princess Anne went on to the Soviet Union. And she really paved the way for the Queen's visit. As well as her royal duties, Princess Anne is involved with countless charities, organisations and regiments in the UK and overseas. It's not just the public engagements. She is involved in a huge amount of charities, some 300 charities, some of which she's founded herself. She writes her own speeches. She has a very small staff as well. Charles famously has a lot of staff looking after him. She's never seen the point in being just a nominal head of an organisation, which is why she works so phenomenally hard. It would be almost impossible to go and visit every single charity and organisation she's involved with every year, but she does her damnedest to do so. She believes that if you're going to put your name to it, it needs to be more than just a, a name on a letterhead. You actually have to go along, see what they're doing, encourage them and bring what publicity you can to them. One cause that's always been close to Anne's heart is Save the Children. Their relationship goes back more than five decades. If you want to improve the lot of children, then you must improve the lot of their mothers. If there is a fundamental baseline to the Save the Children Fund's work, it is working with mothers and getting mothers to be able to take a much greater part um, in their children's lives and in the, in the lives of the community in which they live. When she was in Uganda recently, it was for Save the Children. She became uh, president in 1970. She's now their patron, so that's 50 years of engagement. She's able to look back on a lifetime of engagement with these countries, with the Commonwealth, and you know, resolutely hardworking and, and completely dependable. But Anne made it clear that she didn't seek praise from the public or the press. She once told a friend who had been asking her about the, the kind of affection that Diana had from the public, the love, the adoration that Diana had, if she would want that. And she said, no, she would rather have respect than affection from people that she didn't know. Again, Anne's refusal to cooperate with the press meant that much of her hard work went unrecognized. If she was off on some tour raising money for an awareness for Save the Children and Diana appeared somewhere in a low-cut dress, the newspapers would be full of stories about Diana and Anne would find herself not getting a look in. I think that must have been very galling for her. In the early days, I used to wonder why she didn't force herself to have a better relationship with the press. She clearly you know, had no time for us at all. And she thought we were a nuisance. Such a shame because Whenever we used to write about her, it wasn't about the worthy work that she'd done. It was because she'd lost her temper somewhere. She'd sworn at someone or because she was wearing ridiculous clothes. 
She got a really hard time from Fleet Street in the 80s and the 90s. They thought that she treated the press with disdain, she wouldn't talk to them, she ignored them, she wouldn't smile for them. And in return, they gave her a really hard time because in their view, she didn't give an inch. For many journalists of that time, Anne wasn't helping her own cause. She wanted to be appreciated for what she'd done. She got across that, that Diana was more appreciated than her, and yet she did nothing to facilitate that. This all changed in 1982, when the press followed Anne on one of her tours of Africa with Save the Children. They went in search of a story about her love life, but when they realized she wouldn't discuss it, they took more interest in her work and were surprised by what they saw. There was one particular tour where she went to Africa and the photographers, the press pack, were with her as well for all that time. It was probably weeks and she was visiting refugee camps in Africa. The press didn't really want to go along with her, but they did in 1982 go to Africa with her. And there they saw a princess who was utterly prepared to get down and dirty, really getting down to work, dressed, you know, in jeans and a, a shirt and probably a headscarf in dusty, hot, sweaty Africa, going into slums, the way we're not used to seeing a princess at all. And the tone changed and suddenly there were positive headlines and the good headlines such as she had not had at all before. And I think people began to appreciate that we had a very hard-working princess there who would travel the world and not stand on airs and graces. Now, with an understanding of Anne's work, it seems the present public accepts her unique approach. She doesn't tolerate fools. She can be snappy. She can snap at Lord Lieutenants, for instance, who are trying to keep her to a timetable. She can reduce grown men to tears. She, she's very like her father in that respect. And she is a very, very hard worker and wonderful at what she does. She is somebody who will turn around and say, that's not good enough, or excuse me, or what the hell do you think you're doing? very straight she is what she is and she's always said actually I've got to be true to myself I am what I am and that is a slightly haughty imperious at times princess but someone not at all snobbish and someone with a common touch albeit a common touch that often involves wearing white gloves but you know you can't take it away from her she is a hard-working royal there's something about her um, which is not it's not an apartness but she's not particularly huggy, huggy. So there's, there's, there's a sight or steerness, which I think we, we, many of us like in our royals. It's not only Anne's impressive work ethic that has astounded the public. She's had a whole other career with highs. We had a world-class sportswoman as a working royal, and that's quite unusual. And lows. It's pretty humiliating to be seen covered in mud and water and scrambling after your pony. Princess Anne may have been hard working when it came to her royal duties, but they weren't the only focus of her energies. She was a senior royal, but she was also having a second career, effectively running parallel. Breaking with tradition, Anne chose also to pursue a riding career alongside royal duties. It's really very impressive that Anne was able to juggle her equestrian career as a very successful horse rider and carry out all her duties as a senior royal. Anne's lifelong passion for horses started from a young age. She probably sat on a horse before she could walk. She's utterly horse mad. There is the quote, I think, is it attributed to Prince Philip? If, if it doesn't fart and eat hay, she's not interested. And when it was reported that she was pregnant in 1977, the Queen said, well, we might expect it to have four feet. Anne's love of horses and all things equine has charted through her entire life. But I think in many ways, it was something of a release from the life of being a very senior member of the royal family. Anne is clearly somebody who is very athletic, 
was very competitive, wanted to win, and I think rather enjoyed that dangerous side of the sport. Horse eventing has long been considered hazardous. Anne's royal title gave her no immunity to the dangers. The princess narrowly escaped serious injury following a bad fall while competing in Dorset. I didn't actually see what, what happened. What it looked like is that the horse hit the fence and she got thrown onto the ground and the horse came over on top and rolled, rolled on top. Of it. She was unconscious when I got there. It was later learnt that Princess Anne had cracked a vertebra. These are dangerous pursuits. She did come off, but she, I think her motto was, if you come off, you, you carry on, get back on and, and keep going. And that's very much, I think, her motto for life. The growing success of Princess Anne's equestrian pursuits led to an increased level of press interest, much to her dismay. When they were photographing her when she was riding at events, when she was doing cross country, and they would be tucked behind a fence, and they would like nothing more than to see her fall off her horse. It was generally thought that this year's cross country course at Burley would present no more than a reasonable test for horse and rider. Not so. The 20th jump over a tree trunk into the water at the trout hatchery proved to be too much of an obstacle for most of the 60 competitors, not least for Princess Anne. And that was where she originally, the phrase that she's been tagged with ever since, where she told photographers to naff off. Anna's always uh, spoken her mind and she can be quite abrupt. It wasn't really naff off. Her language can be quite fruity. She hated the intrusion of the press uh, as she saw it uh, when she was trying to concentrate on riding. I mean, it's pretty humiliating to be seen covered in mud and water and scrambling after your pony, but she'd always get, get back on straight away, even after some of the worst tumbles. The inevitable falls captured by an eager press corps did nothing to detract from Anne's formidable talent. At the European Horse Trial Championships in 1971, the 21-year-old princess wowed the equestrian world. 1971 was one of her great equestrian years, I suppose. She competed in the three-day uh, event, uh, the European Championships, and she won. That was absolutely fantastic one. Anne's sporting success showed the public yet another side of the princess. She was voted the BBC Sports Personality of the Year, which is always one of the greatest uh, accolades you can have as, a, as an athlete, as a sports person. So there in front of hundreds of other top, top people in their sports, she was fated as the top woman. Princess Anne's riding career reached its peak when, in 1976, she was chosen to represent her country on the largest sporting stage possible. Anne took part in the 1976 Olympics in Montreal as a member of the British team riding the Queen's horse, Goodwill, in the eventing category. Competing in the Olympics, which I suppose was the biggest moment of her equestrian career, didn't go absolutely brilliantly, unfortunately. It was a team event and we didn't win, didn't even get a medal, but they were there and they did compete. This was the first time ever that a member of the royal family competed in the Olympic Games and it was a huge achievement. She earned a great deal of uh, praise and admiration, both uh, in the world of sport, but generally, nationally. We had a world-class sportswoman as a working royal, and that's quite unusual. Anne's achievements earned her the presidency of the British Olympic Association and a lifelong involvement. I think one of Anne's greatest successes in terms of British sporting history was bringing the Olympic Games to London in 2012. The Princess Royal led the well-known delegation, carefully carrying the flame inside a miner's lamp. 
Sebastian Coe has said that we actually owe her a, a bigger debt than most of us realise for having secured the London Olympics in 2012. Once again, she showed this character. If she, if she believes in something and she takes it on, she will give 100% and more. The 2012 Games are on. She went to pretty much every event she possibly could during the 2012 Olympic Games in London and around the UK and really was the figurehead. Anne's dedication and leadership aside, the Olympic Games were also associated with a more personal moment in the princess's life. While in Mexico for the 1968 Games, the young Princess Anne was introduced to a fellow rider and Olympian, Mark Phillips. Anne's pursuit of equestrian excellence didn't just kind of lead her to professional glory, it also led to her personal happiness as well. It was through mutual love of horses that she met her first husband, Captain Mark Phillips, a lieutenant in the first Queen's Dragoons Guard. Of course, in her world of horses, Anne met quite a lot of dashing young men. She went out with quite a few of them. Um, she went out actually with um, Andrew Parker Bowles as well, quite incidentally, but and she, she was very keen on him. Her eyes finally set on Mark Phillips, who was a, a dashing army captain and terrifically good as an equestrian athlete. Everyone, I suppose, was looking for the princess to find a, a suitable husband, someone maybe from a foreign royal family, someone of a similar background, a, a prince who might be knocking around somewhere in the world. Uh, but she wasn't having any of that. Uh, she was determined to marry uh, whoever she fell in love with. And the man she fell in love with was Mark Phillips. Determined that their courtship should remain private, Anne was careful to keep their blossoming relationship from the press. We found out that she used to ferry Mark around in a horse box to secret locations so they could be together without anyone seeing. Has it been a great strain keeping it secret and indeed keeping it away from people like ourselves? <laughs> I think it has, yes, it became rather a strain. Yeah. It did annoy the press a great deal because at that time the rumours were knocking around that uh, she was going to engage, she was engaged, she was going to get engaged to Mark Phillips and the palace denied it, denied it, denied it and the day after they denied it the engagement was announced which uh, annoyed the press a great deal. The engagement was formally announced on the 29th of May 1973 with the wedding to take place in November. A royal wedding fit for a princess. And a shocking kidnap attempt. In November 1973, Princess Anne married Mark Phillips with customary pomp and ceremony. Captain Mark Phillips. Even though it was November, like her mother's wedding, almost 50,000 people lined the streets to watch her go to Westminster Abbey. An estimated 500 million saw it on TV. A royal wedding has always cheered people up. And in this, as in everything else, Princess Anne, when pushed, delivered. Now the best man, Captain Eric Grounds, puts the ring on the Archbishop's prayer book for the blessing. She probably didn't like very much the fact that she had to get married in Westminster Abbey with all the, the glitz and the glamour and the fairy tale princess. She has always felt, I think, rather lacking in that. Um, she says, I know, I never have been and never will be um, the fairy tale princess that people imagine. And, you know, maybe she feels she's been a bit of a disappointment, but that's just not in her nature. There were a few concessions to Anne's taste and personality. The wedding dress didn't come from a famous designer. It came from her own regular dressmaker. And the cake was made by the Army Catering Corps. The moment we've all been waiting for, and how lovely she looks. Now, we expected something quite different, and we've certainly got it today. Look at that wonderful girl. 
the bit I love about the wedding dress, it was this beautiful medieval looking dress cut from one piece of fabric apparently, but none of us could see it. But on the shoulders, apparently, there were little epaulets just sketched in pearls, a kind of gesture to a uniform. Even Princess Anne couldn't go down the aisle on her father's arm in uniform, but she got as close as she could. So, the bride and groom come out and you can hear the welcome from the crowd. Tradition has it that the monarch often bestows titles on new members of the royal family upon their marriage. I think the fact that Anne's first husband didn't take an earldom on their wedding, as traditionally would have been offered to him by the monarch at the time, was very refreshing. It was certainly the convention that somebody marrying the monarch's daughter would be offered an earldom. So you've got the example of the Earl of Snowdon but it seems that Mark Phillips and Princess Anne just were not interested in a title. She had a title. He was a professional um, sportsman. It looks as if that was partly a way of saying that Mark Phillips himself did not really want to take rank within the royal establishment. The newlyweds were barely able to enjoy the first months of married life before their peace was shattered, when Princess Anne and her new husband were the target of a terrifying attack. Shots have been fired at Princess Anne and Captain Phillips. Perhaps one of the most defining moments in Princess Anne's life was when somebody attempted to kidnap her. They escaped, but four people were hit, one seriously. Good evening. There's been an assassination attempt on Princess Anne and Captain Mark Phillips. Their car was forced to stop by a Ford Escort on the Mall. Uh, the driver of the Escort, Ian Ball, jumped out and began firing a pistol at Princess Anne and her police protection officer. He shot several people, including Anne's police protection officer, who immediately got out of the car to confront him, and he shot her chauffeur. Amateur boxer Ronnie Russell was passing as the incident was unfolding. And I see a police officer coming over from the Queen Mother's house towards the car and I thought, well, that's it. It's all over now. That's the police. It's done and done with. There'll be no more now. And then as he arrived at the car, I saw the bloke just turn around and shoot him. I mean, you can't do that. We don't stand for that. You ain't getting away with that one. So I struck him at the back part of the head. And he just turned and fired at me. That Miss May went through the windscreen of a taxi coming down the mall. Ball's intention was to kidnap Princess Anne and ransom her for millions and millions of pounds. Princess Anne found herself in grave danger as the gunman gained access to her car. The window's all smashed in. There's a gun on the floor. He's got another gun in his hand. He's got Princess Anne by the arm, pointing the gun at her head. And he's saying, come on, Anne, you've got to come. You know you've got to come. When the kidnapper tried to make her get out of the car, she said, not bloody likely. This was no damsel in distress. She refused to get out of the car for Ball and told him that she was absolutely not going to do what he said. She said later, talking about this, that she was scrupulously polite, but she was not going to do what he said. Well, then they had a tug of war going on, and I could see that she was breaking the grip with him. I leant into the car, I said, come this way in, you'll be safe. I got by the forearms, held him out, out of the car, in front of me. And I said, now we're going to walk away and he's going to have to go through me to get you. At that point, he has run round behind me. Mark Phillips has seen that, dragged her back into the car. So when I've turned round, he's there now. He's like as far away from me as you are, and he's standing with a gun pointing at me. And I thought, well, it's your turn or my turn. And then I hit him very, very hard. Thankfully, the incident was brought under control by the arrival of the police. It was an extraordinary incident, 
and she handled it in the most extraordinary way. And the next day she was back on duty, working as if nothing had happened. Just the same kind of attitude as if she'd just fallen off a horse. But her life had been very seriously in danger. And her husband admitted that he'd been terrified. It's another way in which she almost echoes her mother. Because with her mother, there had been that apparently shot fired at her at the Trooping the Colour ceremony. And the Queen just steadied her horse, Burma, and went on. And in much the same way, Princess Anne kept on trucking. Later on, her father, the Duke of Edinburgh, said that if the kidnapper had got away with Princess Anne, poor him, she'd have really made him sorry for it. And I think we all like that about Princess Anne. Following the foiled kidnap attempt, the royal couple returned to life as normal. Princess Anne and Captain Mark Phillips welcomed their first child, Peter, in 1977, followed by their daughter Zara in 1981. Both children were raised without royal titles and away from the royal spotlight. Zara has said on many occasions that not having a title gave her enormous freedom. That's what Anne wanted. She wanted her daughter to be a normal teenager and to get into the kind of scrapes the teenager did. And Zara absolutely has gone her own way. Peter and Zara are incredibly down to earth. You know, they don't even speak in the same way as many, many senior royals. You know, there's nothing pompous about them at all. I think they're great young people. Princess Anne's vision for her children would pay off in 2012 when she awarded her daughter a silver medal at the London Olympics. Anne's insistence that her children should be shielded from the demands of royal titles was not a viewpoint shared by her siblings. Andrew rather pompously has insisted on full status for his girls, who are both princesses, and Edward's children too do have titles. So she's very different on that. Andrew has always felt that his girls should be senior members of the royal family, be treated as such, and have uh, titles to go along with that. They didn't want a title for their children. Doesn't mean that their children weren't royal, and of course they were the first grandchildren of Elizabeth and Philip, but I think, I think she was very emphatic that the children were not to be brought up as prominent members of the royal family, which turns out to be prescient. I think this shows a difference in attitude between the siblings. Anne is a no-nonsense, get-on-with-it sort of woman. She is royal, she has the titles, and she does the work. But she's not someone who takes herself too seriously. Andrew, her brother, I think, feels very entitled. He wants the adulation and I don't think she does. I think, looking back from where we are now, we know that Charles wants the future ahead to be a slimmed down royal family. Not too many extraneous members of the monarchy, but Princess Anne was there decades before him. Anne may have been notoriously private, but eventually, Details of her private life did spill into the open. Rumours swirled of issues within Anne's marriage. And leaked letters were soon making headlines. No, I have no comment to make on the news at all. Princess Anne has long enjoyed a reputation as one of the most tireless members of the royal family. With close links to over 300 charities and military groups, each year she takes part in hundreds of engagements. On this occasion, I'm marginally better organised than usual, I just left my voice behind. <laughs> the only royal who comes close in this regard is her older brother, King Charles. Oh, to be young. 
<laughs> There's this very funny and informative bit of Prince Harry's memoir, Spare, where he talks about how at the end of the calendar year, the statistics and the data come out to show how many events, how much work different members of the royal family have done. Princess Anne is all over that data and determined to be top of the pops when it comes to those statistics. For much of Anne's life, it's been hard for her not to be overshadowed by her older brother. It's good for you in the end, I suppose. It's character building, I suppose. The difference between her and Charles, I think, she was tougher than him. She was always stronger than him. <laughs> she is about duty and responsibility and hard work. And I think as old-fashioned a concept as that might be, I think that's why we like her. According to a 2023 poll, Princess Anne is the nation's favorite royal. Amidst the scandals involving her siblings and their partners, Anne emerged untainted. Yet, she's not without misdemeanors. She received her first speeding fine when she was 20 and several more since. In 1990, she was even banned from driving for a month. It's also often forgotten that Anne remains the only senior royal to have a criminal record. In 2002, she pleaded guilty to charges that Dorothy, her English bull terrier, bit two children in a park. She was convicted under the Dangerous Dogs Act and fined 500 pounds. In 1989, Anne was the victim of a crime when private letters were stolen from her briefcase in Buckingham Palace. Ultimately, they revealed her romantic indiscretions while still married to Mark Phillips. Alone today at her Gloucestershire home, Gatcombe Park, the Princess Royal has said nothing about the letters stolen from Buckingham Palace. No one quite knew what to make of it, but it transpired very quickly. Um, uh, in fact, the, the, the palace issued a statement saying that these were letters uh, from Timothy Lawrence, who was the Queen's equerry at the time, um, to Anne. No, I have no comment to make on the news at all. It transpired when we all started to dig around that Anne had been seeing him for quite a long time. She was going to his home in Winchester every weekend. And when we all went there to talk to the neighbours, they quite gaily said, oh, yes, she's been coming for months. And, and we all said, well, why didn't you say anything? And they, they didn't because they liked her. As for the letter thief, Scotland Yard's serious crime squad investigated the incident for four months. They took 500 sets of fingerprints and interviewed almost everyone at the palace. The thief was never identified. But the damage was done. The letters had exposed Anne's affair and revealed the true state of her marriage. She denied rumours that her union with Mark Phillips would end in a divorce. Have you seen the paper today? Yeah, I've well, uh, released a story about uh, the Queen has given permission for divorce. Yeah. Divorce? Very much. Never been mentioned by anybody. But it finally came in 1992 during the Queen's Anna Cerebalis. Anne may have been the first of the Queen's children to divorce, but her reputation was largely unaffected. Her siblings, their marriages fell apart and the world followed every last detail. Anne's, she managed to keep very private. The love letters were published, but she just kept on and she said nothing. 1992 ended happily when Anne married Timothy Lawrence in one of the most low-key royal weddings ever seen. Small, private, you know, 30 guests for a meal afterwards. She didn't wear a floor-length dress or a veil, just, you know, a little bunch of white flowers in her hair. Had both her children there. I think that wedding was really all about Princess Anne. 
Since then, Princess Anne has maintained her strong devotion to royal duty, a characteristic she shared with her mother. The COVID pandemic curtailed Anne's royal duties, but now she had to contend with her father's failing health. Oprah Winfrey's controversial interview with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex was recorded at this time. There was a lot of criticism about the timing of that infamous interview because it was released on television at the same time as Prince Philip was really nearing the end of his life. It was only a few weeks before he died. So there was a lot of unease about that. Finally, Prince Philip died on the 9th of April, 2021. I don't think it's a surprise that when he died, her tribute was not only heartfelt, but very, very detailed in, t in terms of saying that you know, he'd been a teacher, a guide, a critic, almost like a role model. In so many ways, but in very often quiet ways, Anne has broken the mold of what a female member of the royal family does and is considered appropriate. If we look back to Philip's funeral, there she was walking behind the coffin. To many people, it didn't look strange at all because it was Anne and of course she had every right to be there, but it was breaking a certain protocol. It was new ground for a female member of the royal family. After these experiences, Anne would draw on all of her strength in 2022 with the historic events that were yet to come. Throughout 2021, Princess Anne's diary of public engagements is as busy as ever. But she appears more frequently in public by the Queen's side as a support. I think in some ways for the Queen to ask Anne to do that does show how much she trusted her and relies on her, but also perhaps shows that there were some similarities between Anne and Prince Philip and that the Queen in some ways wanted to replace Philip with his nearest relative. By winter, the Queen's failing health keeps her away from public engagements. Princess Anne stands in for her revealing her dedication to her mother and to the crown. So Anne is helping this amazing woman in her mid-90s still trying to do her job. And I think the closeness which had always been there for life between these two women, we now all had an insight into that. A lot of people realised at the time this was clearly the Queen's wish, that it would be Anne who would stand in for her and not Charles, who might be the obvious solution to that problem. It was always Anne that the Queen turned to. September 2022, and the death of the Queen. As a nation mourns, Anne performs her duty with dignity and grace. I think that even the royal family was surprised at the amount of love that there was for, for them in their grief and, and, and for their remarkable mother. During the period of mourning, a previously unseen interview with Anne is shared, describing the qualities she admired most about her mother. She had that ability throughout her reign, didn't she, really to understand what society was thinking. Yes, I, I, I think that's a remarkable um, skill to know what the true values are and to stick with those, not worry too much about the things, the fashions, the things that come and go, and to understand what is the bedrock of society and what makes it tick and, and people's relationships, which are fundamentally important. During the period of mourning for the Queen, People really were in some ways yearning to hear from the royal family, not just see them in their morning garb, standing vigil. So I think a lot of people were surprised and really delighted by how open she was when she was talking about her mother and the clear affection between them. Throughout her life, 
Princess Anne has remained fiercely devoted to the monarchy and her parents. Really thanks to their example, their advice and their help that uh, you're all here tonight. They're very proud of her and that's all Anne's ever needed, approval from them. She doesn't need it from anybody else and that's why she, she can be so rude to people. She doesn't care what they think of her. I think the only two people in the world she cares about who think of her is, is the Queen and Prince Philip. I have been touched by the warmth of the appreciation that all these many friends and colleagues feel for your energy and dedication. Anne's dedication to the monarchy looks set to continue under the reign of King Charles. Though many royal observers believe Anne would have made a good monarch herself. I think a lot of people in this country think that Anne would actually make a great queen. But personally, I think that we need someone who is a little less steeped in tradition. So I think we need a, a moderniser. There's a close companionship between Charles and Anne, and you see it when, when they're on engagements together. And she's been a key figure, really, in the success of Charles's reign. The royal family may have modernized in some ways, but Princess Anne's traditional values have kept her popular with the public. While the carefully constructed media profiles of some younger royals have fractured, Anne is still riding high. She really is kind of the unsung hero, I think, of the royal family. She just gets on with it, opening factories, visiting supermarkets, supporting charities. She doesn't get much media coverage anymore, and that's exactly how she likes it. In recent years, Anne's popularity has been helped by her notable portrayal in the TV series The Crown as the family's least pretentious royal. I rather wish you would be like that with me. It would suggest I have significance. Trust me, you wouldn't like it in reality. I would. I'd bully her right back. Fancy swapping, then? Fancy being the heir? Not if it means going to Wales. Also, sharing a laugh with world leaders as they appear to talk about Donald Trump. <laughs> and shrugging at her mother, like all children do, whatever their age. I think actually as she's got older, those kinds of moments now, those bits of her personality make her more popular with the general public. And I think her being not first in line to the throne has enabled her to be more herself, to be more true to herself and to carve out a really kind of different role for herself. Anne has also cautioned younger members of the family against reinventing the wheel when it comes to public service. After decades of duty, her advice is to not forget the basics. She just gets on with the job and she sees it as a job. And like her mother and her father, she sees it as being about duty and service and about shining a light on, on the things she's there to see. She's a great grandma, she loves her grandchildren, but she also loves her work. It is really what she's been born to do, I think she feels, so she'll, she'll carry on. She gets a lot out of it, as well as putting a great deal into it. So it is my very great pleasure that I present on behalf of Her Majesty the letters patent to the town of Wooden Bassett. For the princess, whose motto is, you just get on with it, the future will be more of the same. While Anne appears to be the most straightforward of the royals, she's more complex than she seems. What you think of Princess Anne almost depends at what moment you clocked her. Did you first think of her as a kind of romantic young princess? Or did you think of her as this really rather grumpy, tetchy figure, very much like her father? Oh, how's the Duke of Edinburgh this morning? Oh, dear. You know where I am? 
Same place as you. <laughs> or if you're only really thinking about her now, maybe the wheel has turned full circle and you are thinking of her as someone who represents the best of the old style monarchy. But in another, she was quite forward thinking, not giving her children titles, making a life for herself outside of royalty, way before anybody else. Well, so I'm not totally useless. I was quite well educated, one way or another. Anne continues to be busier than ever, and her devotion to family and duty will continue for years to come. If you just look at the beginning of 2023, she was too ill at Sandringham to go to church on Christmas Day. But by the end of February, she'd done numerous engagements, including four foreign visits. I mean, this is a woman with great stamina. In some ways, Anne has been able to serve her country and do her duty without the heaviness of the crown. She's been a supporting act, and she will continue to be a more and more important support to her brother now that he is the king. And I think she will be recognized by the public for the service and duty that she continues to give. In November 1973, Princess Anne married Mark Phillips with customary pomp and ceremony. There we can see groom, Captain Mark Phillips. Even though it was November, like her mother's wedding, almost 50,000 people lined the streets to watch her go to Westminster Abbey. An estimated 500 million saw it on TV. A royal wedding has always cheered people up. And in this, as in everything else, Princess Anne, when pushed, delivered. Now the best man, Captain Eric Grounds, puts the ring on the Archbishop's prayer book for the blessing. She probably didn't like very much the fact that she had to get married in Westminster Abbey with all the, the glitz and the glamour and the fairy tale princess. She has always felt, I think, rather lacking in that. Um, she says, I know, I never have been and never will be um, the fairy tale princess that people imagine. And you know, maybe she feels she's been a bit of a disappointment, but that's just not in her nature. There were a few concessions to Anne's taste and personality. The wedding dress didn't come from a famous designer. It came from her own regular dressmaker. And the cake was made by the Army Catering Corps. The moment we've all been waiting for, and how lovely she looks. Now, we expected something quite different, and we've certainly got it today. Look at that wonderful girl. The bit I love about the wedding dress, it was this beautiful medieval-looking dress cut from one piece of fabric, apparently. But none of us could see it. But on the shoulders, apparently, there were little epaulets just sketched in pearls, a kind of gesture to a uniform. Even Princess Anne couldn't go down the aisle on her father's arm in uniform but she got as close as she could. So, the bride and groom come out and you can hear the welcome from the crowd. Tradition has it that the monarch often bestows titles on new members of the royal family upon their marriage. I think the fact that Anne's first husband didn't take an earldom on their wedding, as traditionally would have been offered to him by the monarch at the time, was very refreshing. It was certainly the convention that somebody marrying the monarch's daughter would be offered an earldom. So you've got the example of the Earl of Snowdon. But it seems that Mark Phillips and Princess Anne just were not interested in a title. She had a title. He was a professional um, sport. Jesus, 
Doki 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 tayo Baka mapusi kure jami ho Gasu tiki Ni aya nari ya kai kai kau Ami sa mo iyo kare tama to Pute kire wasu Waku waku unasera Moge gujo nakimochi Wea wea jami kabu Sekai watakai Kedo tajo nan kana Mabu Siki gute yami no hoga sumato. Sort of the car, I thought, well, that's it. It's all over now. That's the police. It's done and done with. There'll be no more now. And then as he arrived at the car, I saw the bloke just turn around and shoot him. I mean, you can't do that. We don't stand for that. You ain't getting away with that one. So I struck him at the back part of the head. And he just turned and fired at me. That missed me, went through the windscreen of a taxi coming down the mall. Ball's intention was to kidnap Princess Anne and ransom her for millions and millions of pounds. Princess Anne found herself in grave danger as the gunman gained access to her car. The window's all smashed in. There's a gun on the floor. He's got another gun in his hand. He's got Princess Anne by the arm, pointing the gun at her head. And he's saying, come on, Anne, you've got to come. You know you've got to come. When the kidnapper tried to make her get out of the car, she said, not bloody likely. This was no damsel in distress. She refused to get out of the car for Ball and told him that she was absolutely not going to do what he said. She said later, talking about the incident, she was scrupulously polite, but she was not going to do what he said. Well, then they had a tug of war going on, and I could see that she was breaking the grip with him. I leant into the car. I said, come this way, Anne. You'll be safe. I got by the forearms, held him out, out of the car, in front of me. I said, now we're going to walk away and he's going to have to go through me to get you. At that point, he has run round behind me. Mark Phillips has seen that, dragged her back into the car. So when I've turned round, he's there now. He's like as far away from me as you are and he's standing with a gun pointing at me. And I thought, well, it's your turn or my turn. And then I hit him very, very hard. Thankfully, the incident was brought under control by the arrival of the police. It was an extraordinary incident and she handled it in the most extraordinary way. And the next day she was back on duty working as if nothing had happened. Just the same kind of attitude as if she'd just fallen off a horse. But her life had been very seriously in danger. And her husband admitted that he'd been terrified. It's another way in which she almost echoes her mother, because with her mother, there had been that apparently shot fired at her at the Trooping the Colour ceremony, and the Queen just steadied her horse Burma and went on. And in much the same way, Princess Anne kept on trucking. Later on, her father, the Duke of Edinburgh, said that if the kidnapper had got away with Princess Anne, poor him, she'd have really made him sorry for it. And I think we all like that about Princess Anne. Following the foiled kidnap attempt, the royal couple returned to life as normal. Princess Anne and Captain Mark Phillips welcomed their first child, Peter in 1977, followed by their daughter Zara in 1981. Both children were raised without royal titles and away from the royal spotlight. Zara has said on many occasions that not having a title gave her enormous freedom. 
That's what Anne wanted. She wanted her daughter to be a normal teenager and to get into the kind of scrapes the teenager did. And Zara absolutely has gone her own way. Peter and Zara are incredibly down to earth. You know, they don't even speak in the same way as many, many senior royals. You know, there's nothing pompous about them at all. I think they're great young people. Princess Anne's vision for her children would pay off in 2012 when she awarded her daughter a silver medal at the London Olympics. Anne's insistence that her children should be shielded from the demands of royal titles was not a viewpoint shared by her siblings. Andrew rather pompously has insisted on full status for his girls who are both princesses and Edward's children too do have titles. So she's very different on that. Andrew has always felt that his girls should be senior members of the royal family, be treated as such, and have uh, titles to go along with that. They didn't want a title for their children. Doesn't mean that their children weren't royal, and of course they were the first grandchildren of Elizabeth and Philip, but I think, I think she was very emphatic that the children were not to be brought up as prominent members of the royal family, which turns out to be prescient. I think this shows a difference in attitude between the siblings. Anne is a no-nonsense, get-on-with-it sort of woman. She is royal, she has the titles, and she does the work. But she's not someone who takes herself too seriously. Andrew, her brother, I think, feels very entitled. He wants the adulation, and I don't think she does. I think, looking back from where we are now, we know that Charles wants the future ahead to be a slimmed-down royal family. Not too many extraneous members of the monarchy. But Princess Anne was there decades before him. Anne may have been notoriously private, but eventually, details of her private life did spill into the open. Rumours swirled of issues within Anne's marriage. And leaked letters were soon making headlines. No, I have no comment to make on the news at all. 